For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. But the hour is coming, and indeed is already here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That is the kind of worshiper the Father seeks. God in spirit, and those who worship must worship him in spirit and in truth. Please stand for the invocation. Our Heavenly Father, we invite your presence in our worship this morning. Come into our hearts and minds and wills to form into us the image of Jesus through the power and presence of his person. May we be filled with your Holy Spirit and go from this place refreshed to serve you and share love with others. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing while we sing our opening hymn, number 229, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Vallejo Drive. Glad you made it out on this cold, cold morning. Uh, I know it's not that cold. I know that's the obligatory comment is, yeah, we know it's not that cold, but it is, it is really cold. Uh, I first off wanted to thank um, for the last six weeks, uh, we've had a guest organist with us, uh, and so today is his last Sabbath with us, with us but we wanted to thank uh, Lawrence Strom, our, our guest organist. Thank you, Lawrence, for uh, blessing us with your gifts. I also wanted to remind everyone uh, that right now, uh, until Easter weekend, we are in this uh, season of prayer and spiritual renewal. Um, so what does that mean for us? Well, there are three programs throughout the week uh, that we want to invite you to. Uh, one of them is Sabbath morning, so you're already here for that. That's good. Uh, we, on Sabbath mornings, are doing this sermon series called Journey to the Cross. Uh, that's going to lead us uh, hopefully deeper into an understanding of the call of discipleship, what it means for us to take up our cross uh, and follow Christ. Uh, but also on Wednesday nights, I really urge you to come out on Wednesday nights. We're having a special series on spiritual discipline and how to sort of have a more practical and engaged uh, spiritual life. So we invite you to come out on Wednesday nights. Dinner is available at 6 p.m., um, and the discussion itself will begin about 6.45, and at that same time is the kids program as well. Uh, so adults and kids uh, both, please come out on Wednesday night. Really, really um, important and, and uh, special programming. And then, of course, on Friday nights at 7.30, uh, as part of this series, uh, Praxis on Friday nights is offering uh, a series on uh, the seven deadly sins and how to live a transformed life. Uh, so everyone is welcome to all three of those. So Wednesday, Friday, Sabbath morning, uh, from now until Easter, we invite you to come and be a part of these programs. Uh, if you'd like a schedule, uh, you can grab one of these. They'll be in either of the desks in the back after the service. Also in the back after the service is a sign-up for the Crop Walk. Uh, crop Walk is a week from tomorrow, March 4, uh, and this will help raise funds for... Uh, to fight hunger both locally and internationally. Uh, so if you want to be a part of this, again, the signups are in the back. Now, something else uh, somewhat related to that, Irvin Henry has a special announcement for us. For 34 years, the Adventist Martin Clinic, now known as the Adventist Fitness Clinic, has functioned from this church. We have trained hundreds of people to walk for health, to walk marathons. Now, next week, it's, we will start our 35th year uh, at 7 o'clock in the morning. Come join us, and then you could go to the crop walk at uh, 1. Now, my friend Shane preached a couple of weeks ago that he had to go barefooted the last couple of miles of his race. If you come to our clinic, I promise you, you will never suffer that kind of situation because we'll teach you what to, the proper shoes to wear and the proper way to exercise. As Adventists, we have a health message. Good living and part of good living is exercise. So come with us every Sunday morning there are about 25 of us are, that are there. Many of us, many of them are not Adventists. I would love to have a few more Adventists to minister to the individual that comes. See you tomorrow, and the first of the new season will be on the 4th. Thank you.
Boys and girls, it's time for you to come forward for the children's story. Come over here by the piano. And while they're doing that, we'd like to ask all the moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas and all the rest of you to just stand your feet, reach out and shake the hand and welcome someone nearby. Good morning, boys and girls. I need someone to help me do a little experiment. And you know what? I've already asked Christian. Christian, can you come up here with me? Do you want to look inside my little um, picture here and tell me what's inside? Yeah, some coins. What are, the, are those coins money? Yeah. Do you like money? Yeah. Would you like to have this money? Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't you stick your hand in there? Okay. Can you pick up those coins? And now we don't want you to drop those coins when you pull them out. So you're going to have to make a great big fist and hold on tight to the coins. Can you do that? Okay, big fist, hold on to the coins. Can you bring them out? Wow, well, you noticed when it was really, it was really hard for him to pull the coins out when his, his hand was in a fist. Thank you, Christian. You can keep those coins. Um, when we're holding on tight to something, it makes it, hard for us to do other things sometimes. Let me tell you a story. There was somebody who worked in a hospital and he saw a lady come into the hospital and she was clutching something very tightly and she was clutching it so hard that the doctors and nurses couldn't put the IV in her hand. They couldn't help her. They couldn't help her to get well because she was holding on so tight to a gold coin. She was saying, this gold coin is more important than my life. In effect, right? Well, often when, we, when we're holding on so tight to what we think we need, we're forgetting to let loose and let God do what God's going to do in our lives. Today, the pastor's going to talk about how if we want to be a disciple or a follower of Jesus, it means we have to deny ourselves. What do you think it means to deny yourself? To say no. To say no to yourself. Oh, but that sounds so hard. Does it mean to like let go of the money inside the jar so I can le take my hand out of it more easily, kind of? What else do you think it might mean to deny yourself and to let, and to be a follower of Jesus? Um, like if you really want something but you, re um, you, you have to do something else. That's, yeah. If you have to make a choice between, um, something and God. Yeah. Yes, you're saying that very well. Um, so let me just share with you a couple ideas of how we can do that. And these are some ideas that we were talking about at our adult koinonia meeting the last couple Wednesday nights. So one of the things we can do to deny ourselves is to actually fast. And there are different ways we can fast. We might just fast by um, saying, I'm not going to eat junk food for a while. And every time I crave some junk food, I'm going to say a prayer. 
the craving for something, I'm going to use that to make me remember I want to connect with God more. Or maybe you want to fast from um, your video games or your the games on an iPad. Or maybe you want to fast from um, having sweets all the time. You know, there are different ways you can fast. You don't have to just like starve all the time. <laughs> but you just choose some way that you can stay away from something so that when you want that something, it reminds you to pray. Well, that's one way. And then another way that you can deny yourself is by doing something for others instead of for yourself. So an old-fashioned term for that is almsgiving. So a way you can do something for others is maybe to share, share something at school during, during recess or lunchtime. Um, or maybe you can see some trash on the ground and you can pick it up so that the, the world can be a prettier place for other people. There's different ways we can show kindness and do something for others instead of ourselves. So you just might want to think about those ways that you can deny yourself. And by doing that, you're actually reconnecting with God and turning your heart towards God and being a follower of God. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, enjoy Children's Church and have a happy Sabbath. Thank you. Will the deacons please come forward? Today's offering is for a conference-worthy student fund. Uh, this, is, this is a cause near and dear to my heart. Um, as you might know, I'm, I teach 7th and 8th graders how to write and read properly as an English teacher. And it's a challenge, but it's definitely where God has put me. Um, but I wanted to give you an example of a reason, or some reasons, many reasons, to um, help worthy students. All students are worthy, let's be honest, okay? So this is not only a certain group, this is all students. Um, if you look at a, the school that where I teach, Glendale Adventist uh, Academy, our teachers pray over our students every Monday morning specifically. We, use, we choose a different group of people. Um, on Wednesdays, we have prayer groups that meet in different teachers' rooms, and we pray over very specific things. Our school, um, situations that have come up, specific students, that, that kind of thing. These students are brought up over and over again. In classrooms, um, we pray, especially in some of myself and other teachers, we pray over those kids, even the ones that we know don't belong to our church, don't belong to any church, worship in a completely different way or don't worship at all. Um, our international students, which have been brought up under communism and a few other things. So they are, they are special. They each have needs. They're totally different, totally individuals. Um, but one of the things that one of my colleagues prayed for the other day was, please, Lord, send the students that need to be here, that, that we can really help. I love that prayer. I don't know that there's any kid that doesn't need to be there. But in our conference, I know that there are many kids who struggle. Grandma helps pay, grandpa, mom and dad each working. Uh, the students work at school. There's all different ways that they can try to meet the cost of a Christian education, but they can't always do it. So that's where you come in. Um, you can help these students. They can be where God wants them to be. I had one student one year who, at the end of the year, they write on my board. They write little messages to the teacher. It's pretty cool. But... Um, she wrote, Mrs. T, your room is my, my safe place, my safe haven. Um, 
I didn't make it a safe haven. It just is. It's God. It's not me. <clears throat> Sorry. I didn't think I would do this. Um, but what I'm trying to say is she felt safe. She felt loved. She was nurtured. She did, she went ended up going to a different place. She was from another um, denomination. Uh, we we can't keep in touch. These are people who you know, are touched by being there. So your help and your offering will help them to be there. Just um, remember that when you put um, the offering in, please. And uh, the rest of the unmarked offering will go to our support our church for many things that we need. Thank you. The deacons may collect the offering at this time.
Father in heaven, thank you so much that we have been blessed. And when we have been blessed, we know much of the time it's so that we can bless others. Help us to do that today. Bless our students and bless our church and those around us. Thank you so much for those blessings. Help us to bless and bless. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. 
Well, nothing is more important in the Christian life than prayer. So I invite anyone who needs a special blessing or has a specific request uh, to ask God for. If you'd like to come down to the front now, uh, just watch out for these tables. But please come forward now if you need a special blessing and just uh, join me here on the first couple of rows. And as we do that, we'll sing hymn number 671. able at this time, please kneel. Father of grace and mercy, we come before you this morning with our thanksgivings and our supplications. Many of us are dealing with pain, sickness, loss, and other burdens. So may we take hold of your peace and comfort and trust you with our lives in the knowledge that you know what is best for all your children and you work all things together for good. Lord, in this time of prayer and fasting, may we draw close to you as we journey towards the cross. Let this be a time where we intensify our relationship with you and replace the superficial things that we hunger for with a deep craving for more intimacy with you. In this time of searching, Help us to come face to face with the depths of our fallen personalities and open ourselves up to the work of your spirit. Develop in us the virtues that shape us into your image. God of wilderness and water, your son was baptized and tempted as we are. So guide us through this season that we may not avoid struggle, but open ourselves to blessings through the cleansing depths of repentance and the heaven-rending words of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's Gospel reading is found in Mark 8, 27 through 38. I will be reading from the New King James Version. You may follow the reading on the screens. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist, but some say, Elijah and others one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, 
Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me, in my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Who is Jesus Christ to you? Is he just a, the most important Bible character of 2,000 years ago? Or is he a real person who is your friend? See, that was a question that was asked Jesus by Jesus himself. Who do you say I am? Of course, you've heard some thought Elijah, some John the Baptist, some a prophet. But Peter said, you are the Christ. And Jesus told him, well, to be quiet about it. He went on to say that he was going to suffer. It's interesting that many times Jesus told his people that he was going to suffer, but they still didn't believe it. He told them that he would even die and be raised again in three days. But Peter didn't like that. Can you imagine? He rebuked Jesus. Jesus turned to him and said a very shocking thing. Get behind me, Satan. Can you imagine Jesus calling one of his followers Satan? He wasn't calling him the devil, but Satan actually means adversary. So what Jesus was actually saying to him is, you're really resisting what I'm trying to tell you. Today, we would call that denial. Could it be that maybe even some of us are in denial because we can only see things from a human perspective, just as Peter was only looking from a human perspective? Perhaps of all the questions that we could ask ourselves in our lives is, what does Jesus Christ mean to us? You see, it's becoming more and more apparent in America that people have a lot of different ideas about that. 78% of Americans, according to Barnes' study, identify, identify themselves as being Christian. But when we look at the behavior and the lifestyle and the actions of most of Americans, we must say they're not consistent with the teachings of Jesus. Why is there so much corruption, so much blatant sin and strife between people? Could it be that they love the idea of being a Christian, but they really aren't committed to following what Jesus says? Jesus himself indicated that maybe it wasn't as easy as people think to follow him. When he said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. But those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Jesus wasn't saying it's hard necessarily to become a Christian, but what he was saying, it's narrow and it's hard because there's only one way and that is through faith in Jesus himself. And most people aren't willing to follow him. I think it's fairly safe to assume that most people don't have a clear idea what it means to be a Christian. 
Too many of us are relying on an emotional experience, maybe a, a conversion experience that we may have called it at one time, where we felt really compelled by the love of God and, and we want to make sure that we went to heaven. Others may just think of it only as a lifestyle. Others may think about it as one to whom we can pray. Now, the Bible calls Jesus' followers the bride of Christ. Inherent in that is an understanding of an intimate relationship, a closeness, a oneness, because marriage involves a oneness between two people. Now, Jim Peterson, in his book called The Living Proof, said there's three elements of the human personality that are involved in making decisions in, in becoming a Christian. They're the emotions, the intellect, and the will. And he uses marriage as an example. And this is how most relationships start. They start on the emotional level. You see someone, you're attracted to them, you have strong feelings and you get very excited about living in a close relationship. And man, you wanna run off and hey, that's getting married. But then you do take a little while to think about some things. You ask yourself some serious questions. Well, how are we going to get along? How are we going to support each other? Where are we going to live? What's it going to be like to have another person in the home? And so they spend more time together, getting better acquainted. Eventually, each decides that the other one's a pretty good risk, and maybe that's a good idea. They like what they found. But the final and the heaviest vote of all is when they decide to make a choice. It's called the will. Am I willing to give up my freedom for this person? Am I really ready to assume responsibilities that come with marriage? Am I willing to commit? And that's the way it is in coming with Christ. We have emotional response to Jesus, love for us. We have understanding of the great story of the gospel, but we also must decide that he is the one that I want to commit my life to. Now in our text this morning, there are two important questions that we need to answer. What must I know to be a follower of Jesus? People may have a lot of different things, but the first thing we need to understand is who Jesus is. See, the people of that day, when Jesus asked that question, were just like they are today. There was speculation, there was understanding, there was projection. Some thought he was a good leader. Some thought he was a religious leader. Some thought he was a man of peace. And that, those ideas are still here today. But Peter came right to the core of the issue. He said, you are the Christ. What does that mean? Christ means the anointed one or the chosen one. And for centuries in the idea of the Jewish heritage, there was a clear idea that the Christ would be the Messiah, the one who would come to save his people, the one who would lead them out of all of their problems. He would be the Messiah. See, even the Jewish leaders understood this because they asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And this is in Mark, the fourth, 14th chapter. And Jesus said, I am. See, it's not enough to believe that Jesus is a good man or a great humanitarian. He wants us to know him as Christ, the anointed Son of God, who is our personal Savior. And this involves a personal relationship with him. Remember that Jesus said to the five virgins who came to the door who weren't ready and they were knocking on the door? He said, I never knew you. Salvation is a very personal thing. It's not a theory. It's a reality. It's not a philosophy. It's a relationship. It is a connection with Jesus. Jesus wanted his disciples to know that he would take on 
the results of sin and die a sacrificial death. So God in love gave up his own son as a sacrifice. Paul explained this later in the book, uh, second letter of the Corinthians. For he hath made him to be sin for us, that who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus is our life giver. He saves us for eternity, but he is also giving his life for us now that we might live with him in dwelling in our hearts and minds. Peter just couldn't understand this idea. He, he was looking only on the outward appearances, but Jesus was offering more than a victory over the Romans. He was offering a victory over Satan and over sin itself. Peter had the idea that he would be a, a cabinet member, but Jesus wanted more than that. Jesus wanted Peter to share the good news of salvation. Later, Peter would understand this. And in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, he says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus, of Christ, the Lamb, without blemish and without spot. He understood God's plan to restore us to a full relationship with him. Now, hundreds of years before Christ's birth, the prophet Isaiah described what it would happen with this Messiah, he said, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And yet nobody caught that. They didn't apply it to God. They were expecting physical deliverance from an enemy. The Bible tells us that indeed suffering is part of loving. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did. My heart was deeply moved. Last week when we heard the story of the shootings in Florida, two teachers, Aaron Feiss and Scott Beagle, laid down their lives to protect their students. Jesus has done that for each one of us. As it were, he took the bullet, he died in our place. So to be a Christian is to understand who Jesus is and not just a good man, but he is God, the God-man who came down to love, to redeem, to bring us back into relationship with him. He came and suffered and bled and died. And he paid that price. And he's given us the ticket, as it were, of restoration. And he's also offering us his life. His life means that he is offering us the, his presence and his power to come into our lives to, to help us, to show us, to make godliness a part of how we live. That second question that we find in this is, what must I do to follow Jesus? And Jesus made it very clear. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus was saying, there is a price. And he wasn't saying that you have to be doing something to achieve it, but what he was saying is, be willing to follow in my footsteps. Be willing to live the life that I'm going to give you. 
There's a man named Kenneth Clark. He's internationally known for his television series called Civilization. He lived and he died without faith in Jesus Christ. He admitted in his autobiography, however, that while he was visiting a church, that he, what he believed had an over, to him was an overwhelming uh, religious experience. He said, my whole being was filled with a kind of heavenly joy, far more intense than anything that I had ever known before. But the gospel created a problem for him. If he allowed himself to be influenced by it, he would have to change. His friends and family would think that he had lost his mind and maybe that intense joy was just something that he had simply imagined. So he concluded, and these are his words, I was too deeply embedded in the world to change course. He felt the emotions, his mind understood, but he wasn't willing to follow Jesus. Is it possible that some of us find ourselves in the same place? Jesus said, in order to follow him, we must die. We must take up our cross. Unfortunately, we've trivialized it. And something, when something goes wrong or, wrong or we face adversity, we say, oh, it's my cross to bear. But the cross that Jesus is talking about is a willingness to let go of my will and to live according to his will. It means a, not a physical death, but a spiritual death, one where we decide that his way, his life is primary. If we're going to be Jesus' disciples, he is calling us to give up all. We must die to the old life, the sins, the selfish attitudes and ambitions, the old ideas of excess, success. Jesus is calling us to die to man's approval, to take on reproach and be crucified with him. So part of walking with him is being willing to know that whatever he asks us to do, it's for our benefit and blessing. The battle to die to self is not a one-time event. The Bible calls it a daily experience, dying daily. And every one of us understands that. It is a battle that I struggle with every day of my life. I know each one of you who truly is following Christ understands what I mean because self just wells up within us. We're constantly embattling the spirit. And Jesus is saying, submit and let me take over. Every day, it's a new day. It's a new day to take on the life that comes through the word of God, that comes through the spirit of God at work in us as we take in the, as it were, the water of life of Jesus Christ's life. And that's what he's calling us to do. Remember what Jesus said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that do, does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have cast out devils, in your name done many wonderful works, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. You see, we must let Jesus in. He's knocking at the door of our hearts and our minds, asking us to give our wills to him. He wants to come in and give us the power by his presence to live life according to his will. But we must die to self in order for that to happen. <clears throat> now there's a second aspect to this following Jesus, when he's, and it has to do with enduring. Jesus described this a little bit in Matthew 24, when he was talking about the end times, 
and what those days would be like just prior to his return. He describes natural disasters, wars, and unbelievable persecution. He talks about false teachers and hard-heartedness of people. And he says in verse 22, and if those days were not cut short, no human being would be saved. It's pretty serious. There will be suffering. There will be persecution. But then in the next verse, he gives us this counsel. But he that shall endure to the end, the same will be saved. Hang in there. Keep trusting Jesus. Don't get discouraged by your own failures. Don't think that it's too difficult and give up. Endure, because Jesus has promised that he will give us all that we need. Our problem is that we, we're sometimes afraid to ask because we aren't always willing to do what he asks us to do. Jesus understood the way it would be. Because in the parable of the solar, he talked about the four different kinds of soil which represent how we would receive his word and his life. Some was hard, meaning there's strong resistance against him. Some soil is, was rocky, meaning there's big things in our lives that we're not willing to turn over to God. And others there were weeds, things that become more important to us and crowd out and choke out the power of God at work in our lives. But then there are many who will give their life to Jesus and accept everything that he offers. And then the fruit of the Spirit is at work. The life of Christ comes in and we have a life in Christ. These are the people that are going to be with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus asks us to endure to belong to him Starting out is usually a very wonderful thing. It's a wonderful conversion experience. But then there are bumps in the road. There are days that it's hard. There's days that it's a struggle. There's a day, there are days when we're not willing to give in. It's when our flesh wants to do its thing or when someone ridicules. Endurance is staying committed to Jesus no matter what happens. So there it is, Jesus' message to us. First, he wants us to know who he is, the one who is there to save us, to redeem us. It is part of God's plan that he would take care of the penalty or the, the cost of what sin did to the human race. But more than that, he's offering his, us his life that we can be changed people, that we can be reformed, recreated, restored into the image that he created us to be to start with. Jesus was not just a good man. He was the God-man. And what he did was to give us everything we need. The, th the second thing he asks us to do is to let go of ourselves and our own desires to do our thing in order that we be willing to do his thing and to endure till the end. My call to you this morning is to surrender. Respond to his abundant love. Let Jesus fill your heart. Let him be everything to you that you will allow him to be. God bless you as you face the struggles and the challenges of life. Let's sing together a commitment song, the hymn, Holy Thine. is located number 308 if you'd like to follow along in your hymnals.
receive the blessing of the Lord. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.